Hello. Um, so I'm Sarah. Um, as Kat said, I am the head of strategy and communications at Mosameet. And we're a Dutch company which created the world's first cultured hamburger. That is to say, real meat which is created directly from animal cells rather than growing and slaughtering a whole animal. And it's so exciting to be here in Tallinn, one of the main innovation centers of Europe to talk about this technology which could change our food system and the world so positively. And I wanted to say firstly just a huge thank you to Natamatur Lumad, apologies for the pronunciation, um, for organizing this entire event, which I know is a huge initiative for a small team. So there is a lot of excitement around cultured meat. And so today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about where is this really at? Uh, what progress have we made so far? And what are our projections for the next few years? Firstly, this is the Mose the Meat team. We're currently about 15 people, growing to about 30 people in the next 12 months. And we are based at the University of Maastricht, which is here in the south of the Netherlands. The journey for us started in 2008. Our co-founder, Professor Mark Post, who you can see here, was working as a doctor on tissue engineering for vascular grafts. And he was approached by a Dutch entrepreneur called Willem van Eelen, who wanted him to join this new project which was going to investigate the potential of something which no one had heard about at the time called in vitro meat. Mark, to be honest, thought that it was a little bit of a crazy project at the time and took some convincing to give up his medical career to, as he calls it, start making hamburgers. But he also recognized that if it worked, cultured meat had the potential to be one of the solutions to some of the most pressing crises that we are facing, including climate change, mass environmental destruction, and of course problems with animal welfare and our own health. So why change the way that we make meat? One of them is that livestock production contributes significantly to greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. According to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, livestock production contributes 15% of greenhouse gas emissions, which is as much as all the cars on the road and all the planes in the sky. What's more, cattle releases unchecked methane which is a greenhouse gas 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a heat trapping gas. Beyond climate change, conventional meat production has many other detrimental effects for the environment. As you're probably aware, much of the Amazon rainforest, for instance, has already been cleared for cattle. At current rates of deforestation, Rainforests might not exist in 100 years. And of course, in turn, mass deforestation would lead to mass loss of biodiversity. It probably doesn't even need mentioning here that, of course, uh, producing meat with animals results in a huge amount of suffering for about 70 billion animals which are raised for our food each year. And indeed, livestock is also beginning to pose a threat for our own health. Around 70% of antibiotics are administered to animals to keep them healthy in crowded feedlots. This is leading to the emergence of antibiotic superbugs. In fact, hospitals are already reporting increases in patients pre um, presenting with bacterial infections that cannot be treated with any known antibiotics. The World Health Organization has described this as a major threat to human health. Um, just last year, the UK government commissioned a report into antibiotic resistance, and their study found that this could lead to the death of 10 million people globally a year by 2050. 
On the other hand, because cultured meat would be produced in a sterile process, we wouldn't need to use any antibiotic, antibiotics at all. And in fact, we're finding that the cells grow and differentiate better in a climate with no antibiotics. But it's actually not just a moral or a health issue. It's a practical issue. The UN Food and Agricultural Organization estimates that global food demand is going to increase by 70% by 2050. While meat demand is um, increasing more slowly in developed countries or even leveling out in some, meat demand is still going to soar due to a higher population and the growing middle class in developing countries who are demanding much more meat. But producing meat using livestock uses huge amounts of natural resources. As you can see here, producing just one quarter pounder takes 52 gallons of water. We simply don't have enough land and enough water to increase production enough using livestock to satisfy the growing demand for meat. The crux of the issue really is that growing whole animals, um, feeding them energy to grow complex organs such as brains and to, to walk around and metabolize, only to harvest a tiny portion of the tissue is incredibly inefficient. For example, cattle only um, convert about 15% of the edible food crop that we feed them into meat. The other 85% is simply lost. A life cycle analysis conducted by scientists at the University of Oxford gives us a projection of the potential benefit that we could get from producing meat from, uh, directly from cells. Uh, their estimates projected that cultured beef would use 99% uh, less land, 96% less water, and generate 96% less greenhouse gas emissions. A question that I'm often asked is, why don't we just change to a plant-based diet? Isn't all of these uh, millions of dollars and all of this effort into creating fake meat wasted when we could just all become vegetarians tomorrow? And my answer to that is that I completely agree. The best scenario would be for everyone to become plant-based um, plant-based diets are even more sustainable than cultured meat diets will be. The problem, of course, is that this relies on behavioural change. Um, for someone whose background is in animal advocacy, um, my perspective on this is that getting many people to change their behaviour voluntarily, especially around something as personal and precious as food, is very difficult. We can see here that uh, in European countries, uh, at most in Italy, about 10% of the population are vegetarian today. Um, on, if we look at it one way, this is a really big increase and it's, it's very exciting. And this might continue to grow, especially as the plant-based technologies that we've been talking about this morning become closer and closer to real meat. From another perspective, though, we've known about the worst consequences of livestock meat production for at least three decades now, and it's not that encouraging that such a small minority of people have adopted plant-based diets. So from Moser Meat's perspective, we're really hoping that uh, plant-based diets take off as they're expected to and explode. The reason why we're making cultured meat is we, because we think there will be some portion of people who won't ever change to a plant-based diet. And so it's good to have another avenue to reducing livestock meat production. So the very practical question, how do we actually make cultured meat? Well, we have to start off by isolating the cells that we want to grow. We do this by taking a biopsy. For example, if we were making beef, we would take a biopsy um, from a cow. This is done by a veterinarian who um, would use an anaesthetic. Um, we've been very concerned about thinking about whether this process could cause any distress to the animals. Um, and 
sort of we've talked to veterinarians and understand that this can be done without causing distress to animals and also would, there would be very few animals from which would have to have these biopsies once we're at scale. So we take a muscle fibre and we isolate the stem cell, the satellite cell. We then feed the cells with uh, nutrients and growth factors and this induces them to naturally start dividing exactly as they would inside the animal until we get trillions of cells from a single sample. Once we have enough cells, we uh, stop feeding them the growth factors and they naturally start to differentiate into muscle cells or fat cells. The next step is the maturation. So we start with sort of loose cells. We've got loose cells and muscle cells. In order to get them to turn into sort of strings of muscle fiber, we put them around a gel, and once they have contact with the surface, they naturally start contracting and putting on bulk, and eventually they turn into a muscle fibre, like you can see here. And once we um, layer all of those muscle fibres together, about 20,000 muscle fibres for a hamburger, we get with what we would have gotten from the cow in the first place, um, meat. So in 2013, a team of scientists um, led by Mark Post created the world's first cultured hamburger. It was unveiled at a press conference in London and I wanted to show you a quick video to show you what the reaction of the taste testers was. Okay, everyone sitting here with bated breath is dying to see what's underneath the cloche. So, can you do the honours and, and lift the lid on your creation? I can. No. Okay, now, obviously, in its raw state, it looks quite like a traditional bur burger. To this burger was produced in about three months. Three months. And you would say it's... Which is faster than a cow. A a hamburger. Of course, we did some testing before and we did some tasting before. Okay, we can... See the burger cooked now. Happy with both sides of that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> right. I have to say, working very well and under pressure, Richard. Top, top marks to you. <laughs> Used yeah. to that environment, Ooh. right. Eats chicken, fish. We know there's a huge problem with, with fish supplies around the world. Could that be developed in the future if there was an appetite right. for it? Uh, absolutely. This is a technology that can be transferred to other animals as, as long as they have these stem cells in their skeletal muscle. Uh, which most animals do, it can be transferred to um, other animals like fish, chicken, other, um, um, you know, lamb, you, pretty you, much everything. You told me earlier that this actually, albeit a new technology, what did it taste like? Mm. I was expecting the, the texture to be more soft. There's really a bite to it. Um, and there is quite some flavour with the browning. And I know there's no fat in it, so I didn't really know how, it's, how juicy it will be. Um, but there's quite some intense taste. It's close to meat. It's not that juicy. So, as you could see, the sort of verdict was that this was close to meat. The taste testers recognised it as meat, but it wasn't quite identical. And we believe that if this is, has any chance at success of becoming a popular mass product, it really does have to taste exactly like meat. So in the last sort of five years or so since that first hamburger was launched, our team has been working on improving the product. Most notably, they added fat to the hamburger. Um, that first hamburger only contained muscle cells, and that's why it, they, it was described as being dry and not very juicy. And we've also improved the protein content. Um, that first hamburger was actually colored using saffron, but the meat itself, before it was colored, was white. That's because the hamburger didn't contain any myoglobin. Um, so since then, the scientists have changed the conditions that the cells are cultured in to allow the cells to produce myoglobin and give the, the meat its natural colour. 
Another really key thing that we've been working on is one of the biggest scientific unknowns. Um, you might have heard of this. It's the cell medium. So currently in tissue engineering, which is done mostly for pharmaceutical or medical applications, a, a serum is used to feed the cells, which is called fetal bovine serum. This is derived from the fetuses um, taken from slaughtered dairy cows. And so, of course, um, for animal welfare reasons, we can't use this in the future. So one of the most important things, scientific questions for us has been, well, is there a different plant-based serum that you could actually use that would work? In other words, that would cause the cells to proliferate and differentiate the way we need them to. So far, we've developed a plant-based serum a medium that works, but we're still now working on optimizing it. So most of the biggest scientific questions, the most scientific unknowns are actually worked out. So the big remaining question is, can this actually ever be economically feasible? Are we all going to have to remortgage our homes just to buy a hamburger? So let's have a look at what's happened to the price. In 2013, the price for a hamburger, the one you just saw being eaten, was about $330,000. The reason why it cost so much was because it was novel science, but also it was being done on a tiny scale by hand. Our technicians were literally like locked in the lab for three months, stitching together 20,000 fibers per hamburger by hand with little instruments. Of course, all new technologies start at a high price and it's common for them to um, start at really high prices and come down over time as the technology is scaled and improved. And theoretically speaking, cultured meat should ultimately be cheaper than livestock meat because its production process is so much more efficient. We created Moza Meat to exactly look at this issue. How do we scale up? How do we bring the price down so that this can be a mass product? Uh, a few months ago, we received our Series A fundraising and our next three years are fully focused on this question of bringing the price down. There are two main ways that we can bring the price down. One is just by scaling the production process and the other is by, produce, uh, by increasing the efficiency of the process. So currently we are designing a blueprint for a bioproduction process that could be scaled to industrial volume. Um, this photograph here shows what we started with in 2013. We were using petri dishes and flasks which have a very unfavorable surface to volume ratio and obviously can't be uh, moved up to industrial volume production. But this shows how we might move from a small petri dish up to a small bioreactor and ultimately the production will occur in 25,000 litre bioreactors. Um, this is a, um, a rendering by a architect called Chris Whiteside, which gives you a little bit of a preview of what a cultured meat factory one day might, might look like. Of course, creating such a, um, a production process throws up all sorts of practical and biological and engineering challenges. Um, to give you a specific example of the sorts of things that we're looking at, um, the cells like to grow on a surface. They don't like to just be suspended in the bioreactor. And currently what's done in the pharmaceutical industry is the cells are grown on what are called microcarriers. They're sort of little beads that the cells clump around. However, in um, pharmaceutical applications, what they want to uh, derive is the cell secretions. They're actually not interested in the cells themselves. So they use enzymes to get the cells off the microcarriers. And this, is, um, this leads to about 30% of the cells being lost, which of course doesn't matter for the pharmaceutical industry because they're not interested in the cells. But for us, if we want to produce at a cost competitive um, price, we're going to be able to, have to be able to harvest much more than 70% of the cells. 
So it just gives you an idea of kind of the sorts of practical issues that our scientists and engineers are grappling with at the moment. We have done some modeling of how the price is going to come down over the next um, few years. So this was some modeling that we did where we scaled all of the production inputs, but we didn't change the technology at all. So if you like, this represents, if we were just to scale the current technology and not increase the efficiency at all, what would the price be? And I won't go entirely through the modeling, but the upshot is that we, if we go up to maximum scaling while increasing the tech, uh, keeping the technology constant, we get to a price of roughly six euros per quarter pound today. This is obviously a huge reduction since 2013, but having said that, that last decrease from six euros for a quarter pound hamburger down to one euro, which is what they are in the supermarket, is going to make the complete difference as to whether this technology ever becomes a success or not. So where is this extra cost coming from? Why does it cost six euros instead of one euro? If we have a look at what the cost components are, once we scale, about 83% of the cost of goods sold is going to be the materials. And the vast majority of that, of those materials, is the cell medium. The cell medium is the food that we feed the cells in order to make them grow. It contains basal media, which is 52 different components, mostly of salts and amino acids and sugars and also growth factors such as insulin. It's currently used on a very small scale for medical and pharmaceutical applications, and it costs about $400 a litre. For cultured meat to succeed, really the holy grail is finding a way to bring the cell culture medium cost down. So the Good Food Institute have done some really interesting modeling on the cell media cost. Um, this is a slide um, provided by Dr. Liz Specht, the senior scientist at the Good Food Institute. Liz considered various ways that the cell medium cost could come down. Um, you could scale the production of the medium itself. Another avenue would be to substitute expensive pharmaceutical pharmaceutical grade components for cheaper agricultural grade components. And you could also increase the efficiency. For example, if we could in increase the cell density, we'd need to use a lower amount of cell medium per kilogram of meat. Her modeling was very extensive, but the main conclusion was that under certain conditions, um, most notably that the growth factors can come down to a price of $4 per gram, which um, some companies are indicating that it can. The cell medium could come down to only $2.18 um, a pound of meat. To give a comparison, a pound of ground meat is about $3.50, so this would make cultured meat competitive. So what is the timeline? For Mosameet, we are planning to do our first small-scale introduction in 2021. This will be a premium product. It will, um, we project to be about 10 euros for a hamburger. So it's going to be, for, for example, at gourmet restaurants rather than on supermarket shelves. Um, and I think that most of the cultured meat startups have a similar timeline of three to four years for getting the first products on the market. In terms of when this is actually going to be on supermarket shelves at competitive prices, that's really going to take probably about 10 years. Um, it is dependent on the production process being scaled up, and we project it probably will take about a decade for that to happen. Before 2021, we have a few non-scientific challenges um, that we need to overcome before we can put a product on the market. One of those is getting regulatory approval. So here in Europe, as a European company, to put a novel food on the market, we need to get the um, a safety determination from the European Food Safety Authority. 
And if we do get a positive determination from EFSA, the EU member states also need to all vote to endorse the product. Uh, in Europe, the regulators look not just at the end product itself, but also your production process. So you need to have most of your bio production process either in place or understood at a good theoretical level before you put a regulatory application in. So in the case of Moser Meat, we are going to be kind of working on the production process for the next year, submitting a regulatory application in about a year's time, um, and the regulatory process is projected to take about a year and a half in Europe, um, so enough time to have a product on the market in 2021. Of course, another question that we often get is the, um, the issue of consumer acceptance. If we manage to get the price down and get this onto supermarket shelves, but people won't eat it, then all of the effort really would have been in vain. Of course, uh, our first reaction of many people to lab-grown meat is that it's unnatural, um, and that's very understandable, and it was my first reaction as well. But I generally find that it doesn't take long talking to people, both sort of explaining why the current production system's not very natural, but also explaining the, the benefits of cultured meat to convince them that they would at least like to try it. There's been another number of surveys on consumer acceptance in Europe. They've shown results ranging from 90% wanting to eat it down to 10%. Um, this was one example in, Europe, um, in Britain. It was found that 68% of the public would like to try it. Even 10% at the end of the day would be a huge market of first adopters. And we're confident that once we can bring the price down and the taste and texture are identical, the animal welfare and environmental benefits are going to appeal to a broad spectrum of consumers. As well as being asked how consumers will react, we're also often asked how the traditional meat industry is reacting. It's our sense that most meat companies at the moment are, um, think it's a little bit too early and they're sort of wanting to keep observing the development of the cultured meat industry before they decide how they're going to participate. As the sort of perception that cultured meat products are closer to getting on the market has um, has increased, we have seen that the first signs of potential pushback from the meat industry. Um, for example, earlier this year, the US Cattlemen's Association filed a petition with the US Department of Agriculture to try and have the definition of meat narrowed um, such that only traditionally produced meat products would be able to be labelled as meat. But then, on the other hand, many meat companies see this as an opportunity and some of the world's biggest meat companies, such as Tyson and Cargill and PHW, are investing in clean meat companies. Moser Meat was invested in by uh, Bell Food Group, which is the biggest meat producer in Switzerland. And their perspective was, we want to do this, one, because we know that in the future, we're not going to be able to produce enough meat for demand using the current process. And two, they have a growing segment of their um, customer base who are concerned about animal welfare and the environment and they want to have this sort of extra product that they can offer those consumers. So it's not yet completely clear how the traditional meat industry is going to participate but one thing is certain is that the cultured meat industry itself is exploding. Uh, when we started there were only one or two companies. There's now at the latest count um, 26 cultured meat startups. Here's some of them. Um, some of the world's most famous investors like Bill Gates, Sergey Brin and Richard Branson have invested. We're also seeing governments such as the Israeli government and the Chinese, uh, sorry, Israeli government and the Israeli government investing. And China recently signed a $300 million deal to buy cultured meat from three Israeli companies. So I hope that my talk has helped to convince you that cultured meat is scientifically viable and although we still have lots of work to do, it is ultimately economically viable as well. And I do hope that um, Estonia, like with one of the most innovative centres in Europe, 
will turn its technological and scientific expertise to cultured meat as well, so that we can get products on the market as quickly as possible and realize the enormous potential benefits for our planet and for animals and for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you.